Okay. So, oh, come on. Let's go back. There we go. All right. Welcome to week three. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, specifically, we're going to be focusing on uh, conceptual modeling, even though it talks about conceptual and logical. Um, there is a slight difference in these slides compared to what's on Brightspace. I took out some slides from the one on Brightspace that were pointless, but I left them there so that you guys have the original flavor available to you. Um, I didn't take anything important out of it. There was like some screenshots that they included that really had nothing to contribute to the lecture. So that's what I took out. So you'll notice uh, three slides less on the screen here. Um, so there's a big long list of learning outcomes planned for today. Uh, but I can summarize this in such a way that I am going to cover the different uh, kinds of relationships um, and how you're going to diagram them. That's the summary of what this is. So data modeling is a documentation tool. It uses something called ERDs, uh, Entity Relationship Diagrams, and it's designed to represent data structures for an organization's database. Um, it's usually a strong expression, what they use the phrase, a strong expression of an organization business requirements. In other words, you are taking the business requirements and you're putting them on paper. Once they've been written down or diagrammed, it is now a strong expression because it exists. Um, data models are used for a lot of purposes. Inclu there's several different kinds of data models. Um, they go conceptual, uh, there's conceptual models, logical and physical data models, and they are all part of what's called an ERD. There's just different versions of an ERD. It's kind of stupid where you have a specific name of a diagram, but that name of a diagram can mean, can be three different kinds of diagrams. It just depends the style of diagram. Uh, it serves as a guide. So you've created an ERD, and it's used by database analysts, software developers, uh, database administrators to help guide the development and the implementation of a system. It's a blueprint. A data model is a plan or a blueprint for database design, as I just said. Uh, a data model is more generalized and abstract than a database design. Again, it's like um, you start out with a rough sketch. And the rough sketch is easier to fix than a nearly finished painting. Therefore, it's considered to be more generalized and abstract because we're we're stepping back, we're looking at the raw version of everything instead of trying to the nuts and the bits and pieces that are detailed. Which makes it easier to change because if it's simplistic, it's easier to fix things before you get down to actual implementation. Um I often use this as, if you're a person that likes to draw, it is a lot easier to fix your drawing once you realize you did something wrong at the beginning when you're doing the initial rough sketch than when you're at the end putting in the finished touches and you're like, huh, the nose is in the wrong place. I didn't notice it until I started putting in the shading. And by then it's gonna be really hard to fix that nose. You're not gonna fix it. You're going to work around, and it's going to be now an abstract piece. You're going to pull a Picasso. So the conceptual diagrams are there so that you can do a rough sketch of what's supposed to be in the database. So there are three design stages, three different kinds of diagrams. The conceptual design, which is basically what we're going to be focusing on today. The logical design and the physical design. There is almost no difference between a logical and a physical design. The logical design is one that is portable between platforms. The physical design is when you've targeted a specific platform. So you're going to take a rough... Anyways, so we're going to focus on the conceptual design today. Uh, as I was saying before, the logical and the physical design, the logical is basically a, a cross-platform, works everywhere kind of design. The physical design is when you actually get down to target the specific machines. So, so 
physical design is targeted specifically at MySQL or Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. The logical design is everything else before that so that you can design it so it's still portable across platforms. It's just different amounts of detail. So a conceptual diagram includes important entities and relationships. It may or may not list the attributes. If it's a regular conceptual diagram, then there are no attributes. If it's an extended conceptual diagram, then you have attributes. You will never have any primary keys. You may include an identifier or a potential identifier, but you will never include a primary key because primary keys do not exist at the conceptual stage. Identifiers may exist at the conceptual stage. You know, it's like saying, hey, I'm going to build this house and I need to buy some nails. Conceptually, we know we need nails. When it's time to build the house, you're going to go buy three and a half inch framing nails because that's the kind of nail you need to use. Or if you are building in Northern Ontario, you actually have to use uh, four inch galvanized nails if you're past a certain latitude because of the expansion of the wood and the contraction of the wood because of the cold. The building code changes. So depending on where you're building, the rules change. Therefore, conceptually, you know what you need. Physically, it's going to be different. All right. So, middle right there, there's four seats. Logical diagrams. It includes all entities and the relationships among them. All attributes for each entity are specified. So we're not talking about conceptual here, we're talking about logical. The next step after conceptual. The primary key The primary key for each entity is specified. Foreign keys are also specified, and you may do some normalization. We'll be talking about normalization in week five. Normalization is literally a topic for an entire lecture unto itself. In the physical diagram, it'll specify all tables and columns. Foreign keys are identified. There might be some denormalization happening here. so. Sometimes when you do a lot of database design work, you'll realize for performance reasons that your design is too good. And that you need to quote unquote denormalize as in make it simpler. Because if it's too good, it might actually be too slow. Then there might be physical considerations that could make some big differences between the logical and the physical diagram. Like maybe one database server doesn't offer certain data types from another. So therefore you may need to do your fields slightly differently. Um, and the physical data model will be different for every targeted database system. So a diagram for MySQL will be different than a diagram for Postgres than it would be for Oracle. All the same tables and fields and stuff will be there, but the data types might be different. There may be some extra options that are available in one that's not available in the other. All right. So the ER model, the entity relationship model, is a set of concepts and graphical symbols um, that can be used to create conceptual schemas. And by the end of, well, by the time I'm done today, I'm going to show you pretty much every symbol they have. I do it after the slides are done. Um, so. In 1976, a data scientist called Peter Chen came up with the original ER model. His original ER model was super simplistic. It had two symbols. These were the symbols that existed in 1976. This is an entity. This is a relation ship. Those were the symbols we had in 1976. This describes the relationship that shows the entities. And that was it. So then over there, 
on ensuing years, people looked at his diagram and said, that's really cool. I can really explain it to my manager, but I need a bit more detail. So they added extensions to his diagram standard, which includes uh, attributes, includes um, identifying with an, an entity as a weak entity, an associative entity, that kind of stuff. There's different symbols for each kind of entity. Um, it is referred to as the extended ER model, and that's basically what we're going to be using today. And that's what you're going to be using for Lab 3. So an ERD is a pictorial representation of the information that can be captured by the database. It's a picture, like I drew on the board. An ERD serves two purposes. Database professionals can use the ERD to describe the overall design concisely and accurately, which is one of the reasons why Chen's initial style was not quite enough. Because at this point, you could give this to another database guy and he'd know, hey, yeah, we got two entities, there's a relationship, we know it's a one to many, but it really doesn't describe what kind of entity is this? Um, you know, is it a weak entity, a strong entity? What kind of, is it identifying, not identifying, that kind of stuff. So we, they added a pile of different symbols that are all pretty much the same. It's just, you know, variations of the same symbols so that you could create a diagram and I could create a diagram and hand it off to another database designer and not actually have a conversation with them. They can read the diagram and actually understand the gist of the database. It might not, they might still have a few questions, but they'll understand pretty much overall what the database is about without needing input because we're all speaking the same quote unquote language using the same symbols. So it allows us to be concise and accurate while conveying the concepts. The ERD can be easily transformed into a relational schema. And by the phrase easily here, the word easily should be in quote marks, be honest. Um, what I like to use this is creative writing. Has anybody in here ever done creative writing? Good, there's more in this group, me too. So when you do, when you write a story, what's one of the very first things you should do? But damn, got it on the first try. The other group, I had to tell them. Apparently the creative writers of the group had no idea. Yes, you tend to outline your story. You will put in the major plot points, usually in point form, in the order you want them to happen. And then you can move them around, right? But you roughly get the rough idea, you know. Hero goes to the castle, beats Big Bad Foozle, gets laid. There's your story. Who does the laying? Maybe it's the Big Bad Foozle, you never know. But just saying, you know, there's a story, a progression, make a plan. But maybe you decide that maybe before the Big Bad Foozle get defeated, maybe you should flip that, the order of how that happens, right? So when it's an outline, it's easy to adjust your story. Because you haven't filled in all the details yet. An e a conceptual diagram is like a story outline where you can easily adjust things because you haven't gotten buried into the weeds. Yes, you can take your outline and quote unquote easily turn it into a readable story. I, I got published and I made a grand total of like $70, okay? Like when I was in high school, so this would have been the mid 90s. But I, I made money off my creative writing as a, as a student. Um, It'd be like 150 bucks in that modern money. So, you know, I don't know. It wasn't worth the effort, but it was fun. Well, I did it. And once my story is pretty much written, it was really, really hard to change any details. Once I realized I had a major plot hole, I would have had to go back and rewrite big parts of the story, right? Same thing with an ERD. It's easier to find the holes in your diagram when you don't have all the data types, you know, Reference integrity rules defined and everything, all the stuff you do in the physical diagram, it's a lot easier to do it when you're doing it at the conceptual stage. It's quote unquote easy to turn into a physical diagram or a logical diagram because you already have a blueprint of what how it should be. That's what they mean by easy. Um, there are three components in an ERD entities, attributes, and relationships. Entities and attributes you guys have experienced in lab two. It's what we spoke about last week in class. Relationships we're going to touch on today. 
they have their own symbols for each one of these things. And I'll be going over them in a bit. All right. So these, those are samples of an older style of the ERD diagram. So this is like a Chen diagram with one of the extensions they added on. They added on. You guys got to find new friends. Anyways, as I was saying, they added an extension for something called minimum cardinality. Because before all we had was a symbol that told us the, how the relationship worked. One to many, one to one, many to many. But we didn't have minimum cardinality, which set up the rules of how things were interconnected. And then, so we have, the, hang on, I just got to reset myself after that because I'm calling security next time they open that door. So you may want to go have a chat with whoever that is. Okay, if you don't know who it is, it's cool. But they seem to know somebody in here. And um, okay, so the first one we have at the top is a one-to-one -to -one relationship, employee to badge. And it's basically saying that it's a one-to-one -one relationship because you can see it in the symbol in the middle. The things at the ends are saying those are mandatory. If you're an employee, you have a badge. You must have a badge. You're only allowed one badge. Each badge can only ever be assigned to one employee, and a badge cannot exist without an employee. So it's a mandatory one-to-one. -one. The second one is an employee can be assigned zero, zero or more computers. A computer can be assigned to one or no employee. So a computer just came in, it's still sitting in the IT department, hasn't been assigned to anybody. The computer exists. But it's not assigned to anyone, so it's optional being assigned to someone. In theory, a new employee just got hired. They have not been assigned a computer yet. Therefore, a computer is optional. They are assigned a computer, but then as their job evolves, they need maybe a Windows PC, they need a Mac, they need a Linux workstation. They end up with three PCs, so they have many. And then you have the last one, which is a basically a many-to-many. -many. An employee must have at least one skill, many skills. And each skill can be assigned to zero or more employees. In theory, you could have a skill in your skills database that nobody has. It still exists, just nobody has it. An employee must have at least one skill, but may have more than one skill. Please let them have more than one skill. Indicating minimum cardinality. So, a minimum cardinality of zero means it's optional. And it's placed, created, indicated by placing a circle next to the optional entity. So if I go back here, you'll see that a skill is optional. So therefore, they put a circle next to employee because the skill is optional to the employee. The employee must have a skill. So when you read these lines, when you talk about the relationships for the employees, it's whatever's at the other end of the line determines what its relationship is to that object. So this employee must have one skill. This skill is optional to an employee. A minimum carnality of one is you know, a vertical hash mark, which I showed you guys. Um, so when you read minimum carnality, if you see it's optional. It's basically, it's a circle. It's optional. If you see a hash, it's mandatory. Uh, these two slides are basically saying the same thing, which leads us to crow's foot notation. So as time progressed, the developers realized that some of this notation was a little difficult and they wanted a notation that worked across all styles of diagrams. Because when you start doing the logical and the physical diagrams, we lose this diamond. They basically stopped using the diamond symbol at that. So they said, we need a notation that works across all diagram types. So they came up with something called crow's foot. And crow's foot notation has some specific shapes. The good news, there's only four. So you only have to remember four symbols. And in a crow's foot diagram, entities are boxes, relationships are lines, and the different symbols at the ends of these lines represent the cardinality. And these are the four symbols. 
The one at the top is mandatory one, exactly one. So it's saying minimum cardinality one, maximum cardinality one. It's, it's always the minimum cardinality is whatever's closest to the entity. The maximum cardinality is the one to the side of that. So mandatory one, exactly one. We're back to the employee with a badge. The employee has must have a badge and they're only allowed to have one badge. So you would read that as one and only one. The next one down is um, mandatory many. And I like using students and their courses as the example for this one. To be a properly, to be an active student, you can be a student registered, but not active. To be what's considered an active student, you must participate in at least one course. But you might participate in many courses. All you guys have, what, five, six courses each? Depending if you have any, maybe you, I was just saying somebody might have reduced course load. Somebody might have some um, prior credits from a different program. So you all have at least one course, but you might have many courses. This is a mandatory many. You cannot be an active student unless you have at least one course. You might have six, four, eight courses. Optional one. It means that at most you can have one, but you might have none. I'm going to use lockers as the example for this one. How many of you have a locker? I'm just, I like asking this, this question. Okay, not as many as the other group. The other group had about 12. My summer group, I had like one student out of two whole groups that had a locker. It's just summer, right? You don't need a locker. If I were to ask this in January, be most of the group would have a locker. Now, when you sign up for a locker, how many lockers are you allowed to sign up for? One. But you're not required to have a locker. So therefore, you are, your locker is optional, but you're allowed to have a maximum of one. So you would read that as zero or one. Then you have the optional many. Optional many is a little harder to explain to people. Um, because people have a hard time understanding the concept that you have an optional mini kind of thing. Um, let's go with um, with pets. Sorry, um, with pets. It's an having a pet is optional. You you don't need to have a pet. You may have no pets. You may have one pet. You might be like my household that has too many pets. Many pets, sorry, not too many, just many. Therefore, that is no, that's read, normally read as zero or more, or you'll hear some people say zero, one, or more. Because technically, one is more than zero, so therefore, as they'll say zero or more. But some people like that extra little bit of precision saying zero, one, or more. It means that this is optional, but you can have many. So the top diagram is the old style ER model, which shows an employee, a department must have an employee, but an employee may belong to a department or not. This one below would have been the crow's foot version of drawing it. So it's showing that on the inside is the minimum cardinality. And one of the reasons why we went to crow's foot is to get away from some of the lettering. Because people will see this O here and they read it as zero. It's actually optional. So this is saying the recardinality is optional, mandatory. The maximum cardinality is one and many. So each department must have at least one employee, could have many employees. Each employee will belong to maybe one department or no departments. So it's basically an employee will belong to zero or one department. Now somebody just got hired and you might not be assigned to a department because they have multiple open positions. You're being hired as part of a hiring pool. Anybody here who's ever applied for a job at the government and been accepted into a hiring pool will experience this. where 
you do the interview, they do the security clearance, they say, well, you're going to have one of two jobs, we'll let you pick which one you want. Or you'll have one of three jobs and whichever manager asks for you is the one that's going to get you. So when you get hired, you don't have a department yet. So you have zero department. But at most, you can work for one department. And this is an example of the many to many of the employee to the skill. Um, so again, an employee skill, it's many to many. The employee must have a skill. The skill may not be applied, tied to any employees. If we were to redraw that using crow's foot, we will have a minimum cardinality of optional and mandatory, but it's many to many because each employee could have one or more skills. But each skill could be assigned to zero or more employees. And that sounds kind of funny when you hear it that way. But in theory, you could have an entire list of skills in a database table. And you don't have anybody that matches that skill yet. So the skill is optionally tied to an, to an employee. So if we use my day job as an example, if I were to go say, how many people have SQL that actually know how to use SQL? That would be two out of 12 developers because there's only two database guys. Out of those 12 developers, how many of them have C++? Nine. How many of them have PHP? Three. How many have Python? Six. So it's showing how, you know, the, the skill can be assigned to many employees, but not necessarily the same set of employees. That's what this many to many thing is doing. Okay, so now that we've, any questions about the crow's foot notation before I move on? Oh, because at one point they decided it was NM. That, that's all. At the end, yeah, it's many to many. They just wanted to say, hey, it's N to M. I have no idea. It's It's been like that since I went through school and I took my last database design course in uh, 96. So, 95. Yeah, 95. And it's been the same ever since. So, it is what it is. That was just the notation they chose years ago. Okay. So, any other questions about the crow's foot before I move on? Going once, going twice, going three times. Okay. Strong and weak entities. A strong entity is something that can exist on its own. It doesn't need any other data to define it. It might have other data to help define it, but it doesn't need this other data to define it. For example, a person, a car, or a building. You don't need anything else to define it because it exists. As a student, each of you are a strong entity. You are able to exist in Axis with nothing else. You are self-defining. A weak entity, on the other hand, is an entity whose existence depends on the presence of another entity. For example, an apartment. An apartment cannot exist without a building that it's in. It's physically impossible. Therefore, the, the apartment is a weak entity because it cannot exist without something else defining its existence. Therefore, the apartment is a weak entity because it needs the building to define it. So we have two different kinds of weak entities. Uh, weak entities is basically um, the harder of the two types of entities to understand. So we have something called an ID-dependent entity. It's basically an entity, which is usually the child, whose identifier includes the identifier of another entity. It is a logical extension of the subunit. For example, if the building 
the building's the parent, the apartment's the child. You cannot define the apartment without information from the building. And I will use um, my example of um, Thirteen seventy one Carling. It's an apartment building. I know that's where I used to live. Twenty four years ago. Thirteen seventy one Carling. That's a big. That's a big white building across from uh, Westgate Mall. In case you wonder where it is. In there, there's a lot of apartments. If I were to tell you apartment eight hundred seven, but I don't tell you the address, how do you know where that is? Apartment eight hundred seven is incapable of being defined by itself. How would you define apartment 807? You would have to take along the identifier the combination of these two allows us to identify the apartment. Therefore, the apartment is ID dependent because you cannot identify the apartment without the identifier of the parent entity. If this is the identifier, it needs to be carried down to the child. Therefore, the child is known as being ID dependent. In other words, it cannot exist unless the ID of the parent is carried in. Another example is paintings and prints. Um, I don't know if anybody in here knows anything about art prints. When a known artist makes a painting, and it gets sold in an art gallery for whatever amount of money it gets sold for. There's always an option to buy what's called a print. The print is usually sold for a couple hundred dollars. It's numbered. But the print cannot exist unless the painting existed first. You can buy prints of the Mona Lisa, but those prints would not exist unless the Mona Lisa existed first. So the minimum cardinality for an ID-dependent relationship is always one. In other words, it's always mandatory. Because if it can't exist without the parent, it is what it is. Um, now, uh, this slide's a little eh. Uh, this one is dependent on what diagramming software you use. Um, if the diagramming software actually does lines completely correctly, um, if you have a solid line, it's known as an identifying relationship. In other words, it's an ID dependent relationship. A dashed line connects strong entities, so it's known as non-identifying. Um, the diagramming tool you're using for lab three doesn't do the dashed line thing. MySQL Workbench, on the other hand, does, which you're gonna be using for lab four. So when you're doing the diagrams in Workbench, you will see some of the lines are solid, some of them are dashed. One is identifying, that means that the primary key of the parent is carried forward into the primary key of the child. Okay, so there's three examples. I mean, I already did the, the building example with the apartment. Uh, the painting, I already explained that one also. Um, the last one is patient to an exam. The patient name is the identifier they're using. The exam uses the patient name plus the date because an exam with just a date means absolutely nothing. We just know that we saw someone at that time. Therefore, we need to know who. Realistically, it'd be a health card number, but you know they decided to use patient name as the example to keep it simple. So the combination of patient name plus the date allows us to um, keep track of the exam. And these are all ID dependent because the parent's primary key or identifier is carried into the child. Then we have non-ID dependent weak entities. So not all, so any weak entity or any entity that uses ID, that is ID dependent is considered weak. That means it cannot exist without the parent. But there are also weak entities that are non-ID dependent. Um, that means that the identifier of the parent record is not carried down but it still cannot exist without a parent record. 
Um, and I'm going to zoom in to the slide a bit so that you guys can see. Okay. So if you look at the first two at the top, they're both called auto models. So we're talking about cars. And you'll notice that they have, they're actually defined identically. So they both have a manufacturer model as their primary key or identifier, description, passengers, engine type, and rated miles per, uh, per gallon. Now, what's different is the bottom one. Or the one on the left is ID dependent. It's an identifying relationship because we are carrying down the model and the sequence number plus all the other stuff, the date manufactured, the color and all that stuff. And this is actually, this sample is kind of interesting because it, it sh covers a bit of stuff about automotive history. Um, way back in the day, there wasn't very, there was no such thing as a trim level for a car. You bought a Ford Model T, you got a Ford Model T. That was it. You bought a Ford Fairlane, you got a Ford Fairlane. Therefore, we, the way they tracked it back then was Ford Model T, car number 600. 700. That's how they identified the cars. Then in the late 60s, early 70s, car manufacturers started making things complicated for people and they decided to introduce things like trim levels. And suddenly this old system didn't work anymore. So they came up with something called a VIN, a vehicle identification number. Every car sold in North America, pretty much everywhere around the world, has a VIN number on it. Um, so in this case, the vehicle is now a weak entity because a vehicle can't exist unless the model's been defined for it. You can't have a Ford F-150 unless the concept of an F-150 exists, right? So you can't have a Ford F-150 Lariat or an F-150 XL or whatever if the F-150 doesn't exist as an available model. Therefore, it's still a weak entity. However, since there's, uh, I, I, I don't know, I think for the F-150, there's uh, nine trim levels. Last time I checked was like nine trim levels. It makes no sense now to carry just try to use the model as part of the identifier. They created something called a VIN. And often you'll still have the model as a foreign key. But when we're doing conceptual diagram, we don't worry about the foreign keys. So we created a new identifier called VIN. Therefore, it's a non-identifying relationship, but it's still weak because the, the Ford F-150 Lariat cannot exist unless the concept of F-150 exists first. All right, so a quick summary of what I just finished talking about. A weak entity is an entity whose existence depends on another entity. ID-dependent entity is a weak entity whose identifiers includes the ID of their parent. Um, identifying relationships are used to represent said ID-dependent. And some entities are weak, but they're not ID-dependent. Um, they're usually shown as non-identifying relationships. And depending on the tool, they will show slightly differently as a dashed line or the symbols will be different. Uh, when I go and show you guys all the different symbols, when I'm done the slides, you'll see what I mean, but they've got different symbology. Uh, crow's foot, I'm not going over again. All right, so then we're gonna talk about strong entities. So, relationships between strong entities um, have the same basic structure as relationships with weak entities. You have the one-to-one, -one, the one-to-many, and the many-to-many. -many. Those can exist between strong entities just fine. And we will use club member and locker, or we could substitute this for student and locker, okay? These are both strong entities because students exist, without needing a locker. We know the lockers exist without needing a student. Therefore, they're both strong entities. It's also a one-to-one -one relationship between them. 
and it's optional. We have a club member to club uniform. So let's think about a sports team. Both of these things can exist. So a sports teams that have defined uniforms, say baseball, cricket, you know, soccer, whatever. Some kind of ball sport tends to be the ones that have all the fancy uniforms. So often the uniforms will exist without the players. And the players will exist without the uniform. So new season starts, you know, new little league season. They've got all the uniforms ready to go. They just recruited all the players. The players don't have uniforms yet, but they exist. The uniforms exist without the players because, well, they exist. Now, each uniform can only ever be assigned to one player at a time. It might not even be assigned to the player because maybe you have more uniforms than you have players. So the uniform exists, but it's optionally assigned to a, a player. A player may have no uniform because they just got recruited. They haven't been assigned a uniform. Or they might have one or more uniforms. Like if we think about like uh, a lot of sports, you have a home uniform, an away uniform, a special event uniform. I mean, the Ottawa Senators, I think, have six different uniforms. Last time I heard. They got the home, the away, the classic, special event, and then two others. I don't remember what the other ones are for. That's an example. Baseball teams usually have three uniforms. Football teams usually two. So a person may have zero, one, or more uniforms. And then we're going to get to company and parts. And back to the automotive industry. How many of you here? Fix cars for shits and giggles, or because you're crying, because it's broken. There's a couple of reasons why you're fixing your car. So those of you that fix cars probably know this, or know a little bit of what I'm about to talk about. But those of you that don't fix cars may not know this. A given car part can be made by many companies. It's the same part that'll fit in the same spot, but it's not made by the same company. And those parts can also be carried by multiple stores. Brakes. Go to Canadian Tire. You can get Motorcraft, I think Motorcraft, brakes, Bosch brakes, and I think carry a couple of other brands of brakes, but you know. But those very same Bosch brakes you buy at Canadian Tire, you could probably go to uh, uh, Capital Auto Parts and buy those exact same Bosch brakes. So the way this works, it's a many-to-many -many relationship. A company will sell multiple kinds of parts, sometimes the same parts broken over multiple um, manufacturers, and that same manufacturer may sell the parts through multiple stores. Therefore, it's a many-to-many -many relationship. And the, the way they did the relationship minim minimal relationship here is the company may carry zero or more parts because they may not carry all the parts. Like, for example, there's some auto parts places you can't get clutches or you can't get uh, air conditioning parts. Those you have to go to usually the freaking dealership to get those. And each part is saying it has to be sold by at least one company. So it's a many to many relationship. Does that make sense for people and how this many to many thing works? And I could flip that around and use that as groceries too. You can buy lace chips at Loblaws. You can buy lace chips at Food Basics. It's the same chips. Same manufacturer. But also, Food Basics also carries our compliments chips and Loblaws carries no name. So they carry, you know, the same parts carried by multiple people, but, you know, whatever. Okay. So this brings me to the end of this part. Don't run away yet. And I'm going to show you guys the diagramming stuff. All right. So... In lab three, you're indicated go use this tool. I'm actually going to include a link with a little video to show you guys how to use it. 
so that if you don't, you lose track of whatever I'm going to do in a minute, you'll still see it. Um, okay, it's a very simple tool. And it, it creates what's called extended ERDs. It has every symbol in the ER, extended ERD concept. So I am going to start with um, I'm going to go with a student. Okay. So I got a student. This is an entity. It's a box. It has a piece of text in it. We know it's an entity. I'm going to add two more entities. Uh, this is going to be a course. This is going to be a course, course enrollment. Okay. So now I'm going to connect each of these. So this would have been what would have been the original 1976 Chen diagram. We would, in the relationship here, here we'd go one to many, and again, one to many. This is basically what it was like in 1976. Somewhere along the way, somebody said, well, we really need a bit more than that. So they decided we're going to add attributes. And since it says this, we're going to add attributes, we're going to do it properly. And we're going to cover all the attributes types. So I'm going to go and define myself, my student here. So I'm going to add some attributes on my student. I'm going to go add an attribute. I'm going to go student number. Now, remember, on a conceptual diagram, there's no such thing as a primary key. However, we have identifiers. And what is an identifier? An identifier is unique. So when you see an oval with a piece of text with an underline, it's an identifier. I am going to add another attribute. I'm going to call this one a cell number. And I'll make that one optional. You will notice that when you make something optional, it puts in an O in parentheses. Cool. I'm going to add another attribute, and I'm just going to call this phone, just like that. So that's just a regular phone number. Phone number is not optional. It's mandatory, so it doesn't have any modifiers. So if you see an ERD, and you see an attribute without any modifiers on it, as in there's no O, that means it's mandatory. And then we have one last big one, which is, I'm going to add this attribute, and it is the composite. The composite is, um, it's an attribute that's made up of other pieces. And I'm going to use address as my example for this. Because a lot of people don't realize that when you say, hey, what's your address? A lot of people don't realize that it really an address is made up of multiple pieces. Because most people just think an address is a way to get you know, a parcel to someone. But you have to realize an address is actually made up of component pieces. Therefore, it's why it's called composite. It's made up of pieces. So I'm going to add some component attributes. And this will be a street address. Actually, I'm going to add the word street. I'm going to add a city. I'm going to add a region. For those of you that don't know what region means, that's uh, the politically correct way of saying uh, province, state, county, home, division, whatever the heck. Your whatever country you're talking about, region is the generic way of referring to any political subdivision of a country. Just, just so you know. And then we can add one more attribute to this, and it's going to be a postal code. All right, so here's one of the reasons why this is a really good tool when you're first starting out. And this is where, even though this is a really basic tool, it beats the absolute snot out of Visio and Draw.io. When you grab the entity, all its pieces move with it. You do this in Draw.io, you're going to move that square box, and you're just going to have lines going everywhere. 
this tool right recognizes things just like if i grab the address it moves its components with it because it knows what belongs to it so it's a really good tool i actually i use it at my day job and it's free to use so it's well worth having okay so there's my address so on this here we have a mandatory identifier we have mandatory phone number optional cell and we have a composite address those are the most common symbols you'll use for attributes there's a few others um, we can include it here for the ride. I'm going to add one more attribute, and I forgot to do this one with the other group, so you guys are lucky. I'm going to put in age, and that one is derived. Because age is a number that changes all the time. It is derived. Because we would really have a date of birth. So when we're doing the initial design, you might have someone say, oh, we need to track the age of the peep of the students. And you'd put it on the diagram to shut them up. But you'd also mark it down as a derived attribute because it's something that you can calculate. Based on any, if you can use any of the other data in the database to calculate it, it's known as a derived attribute. In other words, just like you can think about the price of a, you know, your final price of something you bought at Loblaws. You go buy your bananas at 79 cents a pound. Put it on the scale. The actual final price is derived from weight times cost. So 1.1 pounds times 79 cents will give you your cost for your bananas. The cost of the bananas is derived. Data, an age is derived because it's now minus the date of birth will tell you how old someone is. Date math really sucks. It's actually really complicated. But the concept is simple. It's now minus date of birth. The difference between the two is how old somebody is. Therefore, age is derived. I'm going to add two attributes to my course, just so this one's nice and fleshed out. Uh, course number, well, that's probably unique. And description, well, we're going to leave that one like that. OK, so now. I am going to actually put in my crow's foot. So I'm going to grab this relationship and say um, the student has optional many courses. Maybe they just signed up, but they haven't been assigned any courses yet. So the student can exist without the courses, the course enrollment. But can a course enrollment exist without a student? No, because that's literally the point of putting a student into a course. That's the enrollment. Therefore, it would be mandatory one. So on the course enrollment, it must have a st student. And the student may have optionally this. So therefore, if the course enrollment must have a student, it's probably a weak entity. That means the relationship is identifying. So if I go here and I say this is identifying, this is the symbol for an identifying relationship. It's a double diamond. As opposed to just a regular diamond, which is a regular relationship. And we're going to do the same thing on the other side. We're going to go um, mandatory one, optional many. And it's also identifying. And since this is a weak entity, we can mark it as being weak. And we end up with the symbol for a weak entity. Double diamond. I'm actually going to put, I'm actually going to export and upload it to you guys. Um, but these are all the symbols that I've used in my career. So I've been doing this for 26, 27 years. And this is the complete set of symbols I've used. There are actually more symbols, but I just don't, I've never used them. Doesn't mean you're not, you're never going to see them. They just, it's not as common. Um, so the last one I want to do is I want to show you guys what it looks like when it's not like this. Um, so I'm going to move this guy over here. Move this one over here, and I'm going to slap on three more entities, four more entities, but I'll put one more here. Okay, so this is the order. Uh, this is the product. This is the order line. Like that. All right, I'm not going to 
flush them all out, I'm going to go, can, what the heck was that? Hit the wrong button. Hang on. Connect. Here. Connect. Here. And again, this is more of the same thing as before, where this would literally be identifying, this one would be identifying, this one is weak. But it is not just weak. There's another kind of entity. And actually, I'll be talking about this one next week, but I'll show you guys the symbol today for it. It's known as an associative entity. You'll notice that it looks like a relationship and an entity at the same time. It's because an order line associates an order with a product. So normally when you want to discuss this kind of thing, normally you would say, hey, we are going to have an order has many products and a product can be in many orders, right? So we have a many to many relationship between orders and products. But you cannot, there's no such thing really as a many to many relationship when you get down to it in the database. There's always something there. It's known as an associative entity. It associates, it's an entity that associates two other entities. So this is known as an associative entity. It's an associative entity is always weak. A weak entity may not be an associative entity. In this case, actually, my first example really should have been an associative entity, but I wanted to demonstrate that it was weak. So an associative entity is always weak. A weak entity is not always associative. So, you know, it's like a superset of the other. And I wanted to show you guys one last relationship, what a normal relationship looks like in this. And I connect shipping method to orders. And if I went, this one is optional many and optional one. No, I did that backwards. There we go. Um, this one would be uh, mandatory many, mandatory one, optional many, mandatory one. Because a product may not be in all orders, but an order cannot exist without products in it. That's what that relationship's doing. So the one I did at the top is the shipping method. And I like using Amazon as my example for this. So again, I think in this group, there was like three people that have never bought anything from Amazon. And in the last three weeks, that may have changed. But, you know, there's like three people that didn't ever bought anything from Amazon. When, for those of us that have bought things from Amazon or bought anything from an online store, your order can exist without a shipping method. You place your order and you go, so you just literally take my money, right? You press the button, they take money off your credit card. You now have an order in their system. The order exists, but that order does not have a shipping method yet. Once they print the shipping label, a shipping method is then assigned to the order. And with Amazon, you know it's going to be a crapshoot, right? Is it going to come through Intelcom? Is it going to come through deliveries by Amazon? Is it going to come through UPS or FedEx or whatever else they happen to be using? So the shipping methods can exist without the orders because they have all these available shipping methods available. The orders can exist without the shipping method. Therefore, they're both strong entities. So it's a non-identifying relationship. Each order can only ever have one shipping method because you can't have Intelcom and UPS trying to deliver the same package at the same time. It's not how that works. And <clears throat> Each shipping method can be used by multiple orders. So that's what this set of relationships is doing on this diagram. So these are all the symbols, literally, of everything I talked about today. Uh, I threw a couple in there extra in there for shits and giggles, just so you have, you've seen them all. I will, now, for lab three, you're supposed to do a diagram using this tool. And it tells you to give us a picture. Don't do a screenshot. It has a tool for this. It's called, literally click on menu, you go export image. Then you hit save. And then you have an image. Because what happens is some people take screenshots and depending on their laptops, you know, they got laptops with crazy high screen resolutions, like 4K displays on their shitty little laptops. 
They take a little screenshot and then they send it to me and it's this big. And I'm like, so then I try to zoom in and it's just, I might as well be licking my glasses because it's so clear, right? Use the export tools. They're there for a reason. Um, the other cool thing about this is it also, um, I can theoretically export the whole diagram. Uh, it's for the documents side of it. Um, the other, the only other thing you guys might need in here is a label. You put the label and you put your name like such. So when you export it, your name's already on there. It's nice to have, because you know what? If I don't have your name, I don't know who did the work. Then I give you a goose egg. Um, labels actually really important on diagrams like this, because often it'll have who created the diagram, the data was created, what the diagram is about. You know, like almost like your comments in your code. But when it's a diagram, you can't really put comments in a diagram, so you put a label on it with all this information. So these are the, you know, that's the tools. I will be uploading for you guys this sample diagram. Um, and I know there used to be a way to export. And in theory, you know, you could actually share diagrams amongst each other. I'm not telling saying one person do it and then give it to everybody else. That's wrong. But technically you can share it. Uh, this website is listed on the assignment on the lab. It's free to sign up. It's free to use. I actually use that my day job. It's not what it's not supposed to be used for commercial purposes, but you know what? It's so good at what it does that I use it. And some of you might be wondering, well, why do you use such simple, stupid diagrams? How many of you have a manager in your life? How many of you tried explaining something to your manager that's never done your job? Yes. If ever you've had to explain a technical concept to someone that's never done the work, you want to use simple diagrams. Yeah, no. No, the oldest guy at work was a nuclear engineer. So I was not too worried about him not understanding what I was saying to him. And the other guy used to build radios by hand. Like both the owners of the company before we got bought out were basically literally geniuses. Like, like they made me feel stupid being in the same room as them. They didn't go out of their way to make me feel stupid. It's just you know you talk to them and you know you know they've already stopped listening because they already understand what you're saying. You know, so yeah, yeah. I know, I know what you mean, but it's the same idea as trying to explain a complicated concept to someone that's not technically inclined. ERDs kinds of ERDs are designed literally for that job. Like if you if you stop using like the fancy symbols like the weak entity or the associative you know identifying relation you just use a normal box diamond and the crow's foot in two minutes you can explain to them what the symbols mean and they can actually read the diagram themselves. That is the beauty of an ER a conceptual diagram. The physical diagram don't even bother trying to explain it to them, but the conceptual transcends skill levels. So it's a good skill set to learn, a good tool to learn. And that brings us to the end of today.